is Atlas Shrugging by Ayn Rand. I shall read to you an example of modern ideology from an alumni faculty seminar entitled The Distrust of Reason, held at Wesleyan University in June 1959. Quote, Perhaps in the future, reason will cease to be important. Perhaps for guidance in time of trouble, people will turn not to human thought, but to the human capacity for suffering. Not the universities with their thinkers, but the places of, and people in distress, the inmates of asylums and concentration camps, the helpless decision makers in bureaucracy, and the helpless soldiers in foxholes. These will be the ones to lighten man's way, to refashion his knowledge of disaster into something creative. We may be entering a new age. Our heroes may not be intellectual giants like Isaac Newton or Albert Einstein, but victims like Anne Frank, who will show us a greater miracle than thought. They will teach us how to endure, how to create good <coughs> in the midst of evil, and how to nurture love in the presence of death. Should this happen, however, the university will still have its place. Even the intellectual man can be an example of creative suffering." Unquote. Do you think that this is a rare exception, a weird extreme? On January 4th, 1963, Time magazine published the following news story. Quote, ultimate performance in society, not just brains and grades, should be the admissions criterion of top colleges, says headmaster Leslie R. Sevenhaus of the Haverford School near Philadelphia. In the journal of the Association of College Admissions Counselors, he warns against the highly intelligent, aggressive, personally ambitious, and socially indifferent and unconcerned egotists. I did not make it up. <laughs> because these self-centered bright students have little to offer, either now or later, colleges should be ready to welcome other good qualities. Who says that brains and motivated performance represent the dimensions of excellence? Is not social concern a facet of excellence? Is it not exciting to find a candidate who believes that no man liveth unto himself? What about leadership, integrity, the ability to communicate both ideas and friendship? May we discount spiritual eagerness? And why should we pass over cooperation with others in good causes, even at some sacrifice, of one's own scholastic achievement. What about graciousness and decency? None of this shows up on college board scores, chides Sevenhaus. Colleges must themselves believe in the potential of young people of this sort." Unquote. Consider the meaning of this. If your husband, wife, or child were stricken with a deadly disease, of uh, what use would the doctor's social concern and graciousness be to you if, if that doctor had sacrificed his own scholastic achievements? If our country is threatened with nuclear destruction, will our lives depend on the intelligence and ambition of our scientists or on their spiritual eagerness and capacity to communicate friendship? I would not put a passage of that kind into the mouth of a character in the most exaggerated star satire. I would consider it too absurdly grotesque. And yes, this is said, heard, and discussed seriously in an allegedly civilized society. Are you inclined to believe that theories of this kind will have no results in practice? I quote from the Rochester Times Union of February 18, 1960, from an article entitled, 
is our talent running out? Quote, is this mighty nation running short of talent? At this point in history, with Russia and the United States in deadly competition, could this nation fall behind because of a lack of brain power? Dr. Harry Lionel Shapiro, chairman of the Department of Anthropology at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, says there is a growing uneasiness not yet fully expressed that the supply of competence is running short. The medical profession, he says, is profoundly worried about the matter. Studies have shown that today's medical students on the basis of grades are inferior to those of a decade ago. Some spokesmen for the profession have been inclined to blame this on the dramatic and financial appeal of other professions in this space age, engineering and other technological fields. But, Dr. Shapiro says, this seems to be a universal complaint. The anthropologist spoke before a group of science writers at Arsley on Hudson. This same group listened to some 25 scientists over a two-week period and heard the same lament from engineers, physicists, a meteorologist, and many others. These scientists, outstanding spokesmen for their field, found this subject of far greater importance than the need for more money. Dr. William O. Baker, vice president in charge of research at Bell Telephone Laboratories in Murray Hill, New Jersey, one of the top scientists in the country said more research is needed, but that it will come not as a result of more money. It all depends on ideas, he said. Not very many, but they have to be new ideas. Dr. Baker argues that the National Institute of Health has continually increased its grants, but the results of the work have remained on a level if they are not on the downgrade. Eugene Cohn, Public Relations Director of the American Physical Society, said that in physics, we are not getting anywhere near enough first-class people. Dr. Sidney Ingram, Vice President of the Engineering Manpower Commission, said the situation is absolutely unique in the history of Western civilization. Unquote. This new story was not given any prominence in our press. It reflects the first symptoms of anxiety over a situation which may still be hidden from the general public. But the same situation in Great Britain has become so obvious that it cannot be hidden any longer, and it is being discussed in terms of headlines. The British have coined a name for it. They call it the brain drain. Let me remind you, parenthetically, that in Apple Shrugged, John Gold states, referring to the strike, quote, I have done by plan and intention what had been done throughout history by silent default, close quote. And he used the various ways in which exceptional men had perished, in which intelligence had gone on strike against tyranny psychologically, deserting any mystic altruist collectivist society. You may also remember Dagny's description of gold before she met him, which he later repeats to her, the man who's draining the brains of the world. No, I do not mean to imply that the British have plagiarized my words. <laughs> what is much more significant is that they haven't. Most of them undoubtedly have never read Apple Shrugged. What is significant is that they are facing and groping to identify the same phenomenon. I quote from a news story in the New York Times of February 11, 1964. Quote, the Labour Party is calling for a government study of the immigration of British scientists to the United States, a problem known here as the brain drain. Labour's action followed the disclosure that Professor Ian Bush and his research team are leaving Birmingham University for the Worcester Foundation for Experimental Biology in Shrewsbury, Massachusetts. Professor Bush, who is 35 years old, heads the Department of Physiology at Birmingham. His team of nine scientists has been investigating the treatment of mental diseases with drugs. 
Tonight, it was learned that the leading physicist, Professor Maurice Price, and the top cancer research pathologist, Dr. Leonard Weiss, would take post in the United States. Tom Deliel, a labor spokesman on science, will ask if the Prime Minister, Sir Alec D Douglas Hume, will appoint a royal commission to consider the whole problem of the training, recruitment, and retention of scientific manpower for service in Britain. Professor Bush's decision was termed tragic by Sir George Pickering, president of the British Medical Association. He described the professor as the most brilliant pupil I ever had and one of the most brilliant people I have ever met. Unquote. From the New York Times of February 12th, quote, the furor over Britain's loss of scientific talent was intensified today when a former theoretical physicist said he was leaving for the United States. Dr. John Anthony Popple, a superintendent of the Basic Physics Division at the National Physical Laboratory, said he was going to the Carnegie Institute of Technology in Pittsburgh in about a month. Afternoon newspapers used large headlines to report the move, the 13th since the weekend. One paper's front page headline read, another one down the brain drain. <laughs> From the New York Times of February 13, quote, with the announcement today of the impending departure of at least five more scientists from Britain, the nation began searching with new anxiety for root causes of the exodus." Unquote. The story names two of the departing scientists. Dr. Ray Guillory, 34-year-old Associate Professor of Anatomy at University College London, and also from University College, Dr. Eric Schutter, 39, an assistant professor of biochemistry. From the New York Times of February 16th, quote, with Britain in a furor over the steady departure of her scientists, the nation is again searching for the causes of the exodus and demanding remedies. The brain drain, as the departure of scientists is called here, is not new to Britain. For decades, foreign universities and other institutions of learning and research, especially in the United States, have been drawing scientific talent from Britain. In the last academic year, Britain lost 160 senior university teachers, about 60 of them to the United States, according to a survey published by the Association of University Teachers. British scientists with newly acquired PhDs have been leaving the country permanently at a rate of at least 140 a year according to a report last year by the Royal Society. This would be about 12% of the nation's output. Most commonly, the scientists who depart permanently explain that funds available for research, equipment, and staff in the United States cannot be matched at home. Some say, frankly, that they are attracted by salaries two or three times higher than they get in Britain, and also by what they consider a greater general regard in the United States for scientific effort and achievement. Others complain about the shortage of senior posts in universities, about the administrative jungle through which research grants must pass in Britain, and about what they term the mean controlling hand of the Treasury in all university grants." Unquote. Now, what intellectual arguments are being offered to the scientists as an inducement to prevent them from leaving, and what practical remedies are being proposed? Quinton Hogg, Secretary of State for Education and Science, quote, appealed to the patriotism of scientists to stay at home. It is better to be British than anything else, he said. 